your mother. <laughs> so I'm Matt Vella with Time Magazine. I'm here with Lauren from Ogilvy. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you to Collision. Yeah, uh, so we hear this mantra a lot. Brands matter. Brands have mattered for 100 years uh, or more, but, but why is that more true now than ever? And, and why, what do you mean when you say that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of brands mattering, and I use this expression a lot, that um, at, at Ogilvy we make brands matter, and people automatically default to, well, what does that mean? How? Why? And I, what, what we mean by that is really that we live in an age of such fragmentation and so much choice, and we all know that there's such decision paralysis um, for, for, for consumers. And the idea that you are a brand that understands how you want to show up and how you want to be there for that consumer, it's, it's more important than ever because consumers have more access than ever. Right. And you know, we, we were obviously talking a lot backstage about a brand um, like United and the, the, the issue that, that they had on their, on their plane. And that's why, yeah. that's why brands matter now more than ever because it's not enough just to say, you have to do what you say. Yeah. Um, and I think that that comes with an incredible amount of responsibility, but it also comes with an incredible amount of opportunity. Yeah. And I think consumers are looking to brands now more than ever to give them um, the best experience and they're, they're, they're craving it. Uh, and some brands do a really good job getting it right. Some brands trip up. The best brands are the ones that trip up admit it right. and move on. Yeah, well, so this, you, you know, you bring up United, Pepsi, obviously. Yeah. It seems like it's the most dangerous time in history to be a CMO. Like, things could go wrong in so many ways uh -huh. that you don't even have to make a wrong call about your, your ad. Uh, so, like, how, how has that changed the kind of playbook? It used to be, you know, we ha we've, de we've defined the brand. Here's what it looks like. Here's how it talks. Here's what we mean, here's what we won't do, we'll do. Uh, and then, you know, you sold stuff, you go, right? You put, and you put yeah. the ads out. Yeah. Now it's like, you know, how, how do we react when someone, one of our 10,000 employees makes a huge mistake, mm -hmm. or when a small group of people decides really wrong direction for the ad, or whatever, you know, it seems like the toolkit has either expanded, or, or how, do you, how has that changed the sort of CMO's yeah. dilemma, if you will? I, th I think in two ways. I think number one, we used to think of our most important audience as the consumer. I think we now need to think of our most important audience as our employee. And the idea of inside out branding, it's been around for decades. Uh, Harvard Business Review um, wrote a an article actually by someone that used to work at Ogilvy that's now a client, uh, Colin Mitchell, about uh, inside out branding and why yeah. your employees need to understand your brand better than anybody else. And I think that um, that idea is, is more true than it was uh, even then. It was kind of talked about at the time, but when you look at what has happened recently, yeah. what you say doesn't matter if one employee on one plane, on one runway, yeah. doesn't understand, um, and I'm not saying that employee did or didn't understand, yeah. but the, the, the risks of your, audi your internal audience not understanding what you stand for and how what you does matters as much, if not more, than what you say, um, has never been more important. So it's, it's employees first, consumers um, second. And then I think the second way it's changed is we're CMOs because there's so much talk around the, the tenure of the CMO and, oh, the tenure yesterday was 18 months. Oh, it's gone down to 15 months and 14 months. And before you know it, you're, you're, you, know, you start your job on Monday and you're gone by Friday. We have to be willing to admit when we screwed up. Yeah. We have to own it. We have to be okay with it. Yeah. We have to look at it as, you know, and, and, and if you think about Pepsi, that's a learning experience for them. Sure, you can say, oh, in-house agency, this is why in-house agencies will never work. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, they're, they're going to learn from that. And right. the next time they use that in-house agency to do something, it's going to be that much better because of that, uh, that experience that they went through. So I think, you know, putting, putting your employees first and, and also being able to admit um, when, when something didn't quite hit the mark and, and learn from it. So whose job is that internal messaging? Is that the CEO's job? Is that the CMO's job? Like who, who really needs to take the reins of explaining what uh, you know, a company's brand or stable of brands mean to the people who are working on that brand? What's the most effective way to do that? I mean, is it uh, group I, I Tai Chi in the morning? Like what, how do you actually 
explain to people what why Tiffany's means X yeah. or you know. I think it's the it's the C. I mean, look, it's it, it's it's everybody's job in the in the C-suite to 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 do it and to embrace it. I think it's the CMO's job to help um, articulate uh, with the CEO how to do it because, especially when you're a global organization, our cultures are so nuanced. And if you look at everything that um, has been happening in the U.S. compared to things that have been happening in Paris compared to things that have been happening in Kenya, compared to things that have been happening in you know, Mexico, et cetera. There, there, there's the overarching message that you want to deliver, but then there's also the, the, new, the nuance that goes along with it. So I think that it's the CEO's job to own it, to articulate it, to be the sort of talking, um, talking piece, and, and, and the accountability needs to stop with, with um, her or him. Um, nice. But it's the CMO's job to, to help her or him get to that place. Right. And also to take the feedback and to take how the message has been received and and you know figure out what to what to do with it and, yeah. and, and, and how to, to better craft it moving yeah. moving forward. In this environment that we're in generally, is it easier to be a new brand, a brand new brand like an Uber, or is it is it easier to be, you know, a storied brand like This is not one we talked about yeah. in the forty five minutes we just spent together. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good question. Establishing new I can't identity. say both, right? I can't say both. Sure, and. you could say both. Um, I, I, I think, from a CMO perspective, it's easier to be a non-new brand, and I say that because I still think a lot of newer brands put um, a disproportionate amount of their focus on product and utility, and not enough of their focus on brand and marketing. Um, and that's not to say product and utility is not important, it's very important, but if you don't have that balance of, yes, it's about product and utility, but guess what, if you get your product so right and you haven't um, necessarily spent any time building your brand, there's a million other people that can come and steal right. um, the, 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 the utility. And guess what, brands can steal the utility and that may or may not include acquiring you right. along the process. Right, right. So I, I, I think, from a CMO perspective, it's, it's easier to work with a natural marketing organization that understands the importance of, of, of branding and marketing. I think a lot of these newer companies will get there. Um, if, 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 you know, just using Uber as an example, I think they're doing a lot of interesting things to kind of help, um, help build their, their brand and their, and their brand message. But I, I still think in the main, there's just too much as I said, disproportionate focus on, on, on product over, over brand. Interesting. Yeah, and it's interesting, the, oops, the context we're in now of, or it used to be, we were talking about this before, it used to be, you know, I'm a company, I have a one-to-one -one relationship with my customer, I'm trying to get them to do X. But now, every transaction potentially has, you know, millions of observers, some of whom are also your customers, some of whom don't, aren't, and will never be, you know, but are gonna talk about what's happening. Mm -hmm. So. How, 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 how do you manage that, you know, I mean? It's, it's nearly impossible. Okay. I, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think the, again, the, the best thing you can do is understand how you can pay that much more attention to the ones who are out there talking about you, yeah. um, spreading your message, buying your product, um, and, and, and really the believers and the evangelists. I mean, I, I, I think that there's also, um, especially when I think about uh, retailers right now, and, and particularly the, the you know big box retailers, um, with the dawn of you know the rise of e-commerce and brands like Amazon, et cetera, it's very hard to be uh, you know to be really you know happy about about the future if you're a big box retailer. I think a lot of what some of them haven't necessarily done right is really embrace the loyalist, and the loyalist has gone from being a loyalist to a shopper. Um, and then all of a sudden, the prospect becomes the loyalist before even ste ste stepping foot in yeah. the in the store. I um, so I think I think we've we, in some in, in some ways we've lost this ability to really embrace the loyalists. Um, even when I think about loyalty programs yeah. and, and and CRM programs and how they have changed, I think there's a real opportunity 
to have the loyalists and the, the voice of the loyalists sort of saturate. Right. Um, Is the Amazon Prime customer who spends more, talks about Amazon more than, you know, and, and I and I and I and I have a CBS I've, card. Yeah. Like and I, honestly, I love Amazon as, as many people do, and I and I think they're they're doing a, a, a amazing things and they're innovating in a lot in a lot of ways, you know. But at, at the same time, are they doing the best job, really making a Prime customer feel? Special and succinct and different. I mean, I don't, this is what this is what American Express has done so well o o over the years, right? Which is this idea of you know membership yeah, yeah. and w and it really defining what it means to be a member. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's something that they've done an incredible job of owning. And I think I think some of that has been lost um, as we've as we've moved into into this world of. Um, as you said, sort of anyone at any time, anywhere, being able to speak about. Uh, so, is about that idea brand. of membership like a bulwark against or a safety net against the kind of randomness that that can happen to your brand, whether it's on social media or some viral thing that goes? I think wrong? it can. I, I think it can be. I mean, I wouldn't look at it as a safety net uh, as much as I would look at it as a truth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a truth that, again, you know, you you have to um, you have to hold yourself by and be accountable for in every single transaction, whether that be a you know tweet um, to a you know a a, uh, a conversation with a call center to a piece of you know mail that you receive, because many uh, many organizations still do believe in the in the in the power of of direct mail. Um, but it's a it's if it, it, it's a truth, and I think that's sort of the beauty of, of a lot of these um, these brands that have been uh, around for quite for quite some time. Is that there's a lot of equity there, and there's a lot of truth there, and it's about harnessing that truth and making it relevant um, in the in the digital age and you know the post digital age. And I think that's the mm -hmm. that's the uh, that's the trick. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this idea of, of the new buyer, which I think is what this is. This session is called, um, and that's that, that's really what I mean by the new buyer. It's this it's the CMO in many cases who is coming from a more disruptive company, um, like a uh, you know, in, in one of our clients, IBM, our our, our new C, CMO there, Michelle Peluso, was the CEO of Gilt. Um, uh, Guild group, and, and that's what I mean. It's this sort of disruptor marketer who's coming yeah. into a company that has real equity in in brand truth, yeah. and how does uh, she or he um, use that and use that equity, but tailor it and make it relevant yeah. for for the world that we live in? How does she or he use it um, in terms of data yeah. and customer data and insights and agility? Yeah. I mean, you know, the other thing about the new buyer is they have the, the new the, the marketer the that succeeds has to be a marketer that understands how to take strategy to execution in a very, very condensed yeah. time frame. And how, how do you, what, who is the new buyer, disruptor CMO's like best friend to keep them from either going too far too fast if they're at a company that's been around forever like IBM or, or making a misstep that it's hard to come back from? Because honestly, in this environment, one bad mistake and you know, yeah. it's easy to be gone. So I, I think they're, I think internally, um, in many ways, their best friend, it, and, and this hasn't changed. It is the CEO, uh, because you need a you need a leader that um, you know understands what you're trying to do. And in many cases, it's hard. You're dealing with um, companies that have have had people that are resistant to change. Um, and it's hu it's human behavior, right? No one likes change. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental truth of, of all of us. Yes. Um, and it's hard, and change is hard, and you know, it's not it, it's not comfortable, and it's not easy. Uh, and I think they 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 need a CEO that does want change and, and, and supports them. And then I think on the sort of agency or or um, the ugly word vendor side, um, their best friend is someone that understands the power of collaboration. Someone that understands that it's okay to not do it all and to be all things at all times, to know what they don't know, yeah. um, to know, you know who to bring in. I mean, for me as a marketer, I love people that understand, okay, Lauren, we're not really good at this, but them over here, they're amazing at it. Yeah. So let's partner with them and guess what? We'll end up doing right. better and making more money and being more, being more profitable in the long term if we understand who to partner with are, and are why. Are people generally, you don't have to name names, but you know, are people generally willing to say, here's what I don't know, or is it, is it a lot of work getting them to that, to that point? I think it's a lot of work getting up to that point, 
not because they, um, they think they know everything, but because, again, in this, to your point, dangerous CMO time and in this fear factor time I've of, really one, little, it. of yeah. one little mistake, um, it, it, it's more, it, it's, 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 it's frightening, right? It just, it just, it adds to the, to the frightening ladder yeah. to have to admit that you, that you don't know something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, knowing what you don't know is probably one of the most powerful things that you can, um, that you can have as a, as a, as an individual at large and specifically as a marketer. Hmm. All right, well, we're close to the end of time and I'm going to ask you a question that we didn't talk about, but, uh, do you miss Mad Men? I mean, like, does does the do all CMOs miss the days when everyone was watching? I know? mean, I I, will, I, I don't even. Th I think my parents were like, you know, on acid in like Columbia or something when during during the Mad Men era. I, I wasn't even like. I don't even know if they were married yet. Um, so I, I wasn't. I wasn't even around for it. Um, I mean, Peggy Olson is now a handmaiden. I it's kind of yeah. like it says something about the culture, doesn't it? Like, no, it, it 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 does, and I and I think look, I, I think there's a romance of Mad Men that I, I can say, you know, even though I, I wasn't um, around at the time, that, that yeah. I could say is missing right now. Yeah. Um, our, our industry doesn't feel as romantic yeah. as, as it probably used to. Um, and I think that, you know, if you ask anybody um, that is sort of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm technically millennial, 1980, so technically I, get, I still get to say that. Um, but if you ask anyone who's sort of, you know, early uh, or late millennial, kind of, you know, late Gen X, um, it, it, is, it is hard to, to work in an industry that's sort of missing that, you know, piece yeah. of, 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 you know, romanticism and kind of desperately is, is, there is, any is craving it back. Is there, you know... You see it in moments. You know, I think the idea of, of, of walking into a room with a client and presenting an idea that is emotive, yeah. that is still very much real. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been in many situations where you present a piece of, of, of film content, um, and you know, you 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 get the like the, the, the goosebumps, ad, you know, something. from 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 your client. And I think it still exists in pockets, yeah. and you know, it must exist enough for us all to be all to be Employed. you know to doing it and yeah, still yeah. here. Um, but I think that side of of, of Mad Men, I, I would say I I I, I yeah. miss. But we've we've come so far as an yeah. industry since yeah. then too. I mean. I, I don't think CMOs had anywhere near the, 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 the real power that they do now. I mean, CMOs now have a real opportunity to, to change their organization, in, in, yeah. some, in some cases more than the CEO. And, and I think that um, has changed a lot from the, from, the, yeah. from the Mad Men days. I do miss the media creative synergy. How so? That, it, it was very much together during, the, during that era. And there's hmm. been a sort of bundling, unbundling, bundling, That's unbundling. Um, I think we're coming back into a more of a bundling uh, era, but I think media and creative are still way too separate too far away. Um, right now, and that, that, that is something as a marketer that I believe wholeheartedly we need, to, um, we need to get back into. And quite frankly, the onus is more on the agencies than it is on the client. The agencies should really be doing that, um, na that naturally and not relying on the client um, uh, uh, for that at all, but that, that would be another piece okay. of a little right. Mad Menness that I miss. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Let's please thank, thank Lauren for thank you, thank you, everyone for being here. Thank questions. you. All right, thank you.